Okay, so welcome to this uh, lecture 24, and it's the 8th of December, and let's continue with our quantum physics for non-physicists course. So today we will talk about more about the evolution of density matrix. So both in isolated systems, that is, we'll just take the Schrodinger equation and we'll generalize it for the case of uh, mixed states. And also we look at dynamics of open systems. That's when the system is in contact with some environment, and we'll see what we can say about this, um, about the evolution of the density matrix then. And we'll be back to following the book a bit closer. So this is the um, Ben Schumacher and Mike Westmoreland book. So they talked a lot about density matrices in chapter eight and a little bit even about thermal states there, but we didn't follow it that closely. Uh, but for this evolution, we will follow it in sections 8.5 and 9.3. Now, the daily analogy will not be about the contents of this class, but it's a little bit about the contents of the course in the next semester, these advanced topics of quantum information theory. And it's about the first uh, examples for quantum clocks. So, uh, you know, when there are some people who manage to keep their room tidy, and then there's some people who, especially children, who manage to tidy it just in time for the inspections, so when their parents come to check the room, but in between the, the room is a total mess. Yeah. So that's like here, like the, this kid hid all the toys near the bed, for example. Uh, and the first models for quantum clocks, they were exactly like this. So these would be systems that if you measure them at the right time, so like, for example, at the right hour, then they give you exactly the right outcome. So the, the Hilbert space would be, for example, the span of just all the hours from 1 to 12. And the evolution was such that if you measured it, you know, every hour, then you'd get exactly um, the right outcome. So it would tell it's 1 p.m., it's 2 p.m., it's 3 p.m. The problem was that in between, so if you measured it at the hour and a few minutes, then it would be a total mess. Yeah. You, you could get like any hour with any probability. And then later on, the way people solve this is to take, to see, well, this, the silver space is just too small. We need a larger system. And then they, you know, most quantum models for clocks, now they, they have something like a Gaussian state that evolves in a more smooth way in between uh, the correct, like the fixed times. So we'll see, we'll talk about clocks in general, also more about quantum thermodynamics in the course of advanced topics in quantum information theory next semester, which you can take after this course. Good, for housekeeping, I only have one item, which is I got a reminder to remind you to fill in uh, the official feedback form. So this should be available until the 11th of December, so I hope you see this on time. Okay, so let's just check where we are. We spent a lot of time talking about quantum thermodynamics, so thermal states, what's heat and work, heat engines, and this idea of erasure in Landauer's principle. Uh, and we saw that there was one missing element for treating, for example, heat engines completely, and this was to model these couplings to a heat path. And in order to do this, we need a bit more uh, mathematical machinery, so we need to know how to model the evolution of open systems, meaning systems in contact with some other systems. And that's what we'll do today in this Lindblad evolution. Then the only thing that will be left to do uh, in this uncertainty package is to talk about the entropy and talk about uh, uncertainty relations. Yep. So we'll see how far we get today on this. So let's just recap what we had from a long time ago when he talked about Schrodinger's equation, in particular for uniform dynamics, this was when the Hamiltonian did not depend on time. So in this case, we saw that uh, that time evolution was governed by this differential equation. So this is the state at a certain time t, and the derivative in time, so how much it changes, dependent only on, the, on this Hamiltonian of the system with this factor behind it, right? Um, and we saw that from this, we can, we can solve this, this equation and we get that the state at a time t depends on the original state via this unitary evolution. And this unitary was just the exponential of the, of the Hamiltonian and the time, right? And this factor here is just the same as this. Good, so now there's two ways in which we can generalize this. 
The first one is to replace the state with a density matrix. So now we want not only pure states, but also um, mixed states in general that can evolve. So we'll see how this is done. And the other thing is, well, instead of having a unitary evolution of the density matrix, we can have an evolution that is just a map. It's just a quantum channel. Because for example, the system is in contact with a large environment. And in this case, like, of course, the evolution will not have this form. So in particular, instead of the Hamiltonian, we must have some other uh, operator there, and we'll see what this operator uh, can be. OK. So given this, let's start. OK. So and let's just start with how we evolve density operators in general. So we always say that row of t, this is going to be some unitary of t, row u of t dagger, right? And the same is true for the, for the particular case of the Schrodinger equation, right? Do we know that this u of t is given by this? So we just replace this here. So we have u of t, whoop. u of t is given by e to minus i over h bar t h. And now we take the case um, so instead of t, we consider some dt that's very, very small, and we just call this delta. Yeah. So what we'll do is just expand is just expand this. So this is going to be uh, in like the Taylor expansion of this thing here is going to be the identity minus i over h bar t h plus other terms that are, oh, sorry, this t should be delta, plus other terms that are order of delta square, right? So I just did the Taylor expansion of the exponential. We've done this many times. OK, so now we replace this in here. So now we have that row of t plus delta. This is u of delta rho of t, u of delta dagger. OK, so this is going to be, let's just put what's there, u minus i over h bar delta h plus this terms of took. Here's the rho of t. And now again, the same. Uh, it's the complex conjugate, so this is i. Delta H, H is their mission, so H dagger is the same as H plus order of delta square. Okay, so now we expand the, all the terms. So first we have identity and identity, kind of sandwiching the density operator at time t, so that's just row of t. Then we have um, identity in this term. So plus i over h bar delta, and we have rho of t h. Then we have this term on one side, rho and the identity on the other. So that's minus i over h bar delta. Sorry, delta h, rho of t. And then all the other terms, so we have the term that has this and this, we'll have delta square. This and this, we'll have delta cube. Um, this and this, we'll have delta cube, and this and this, we'll have delta to the fourth. So everything else is order of delta square. And remember, we're trying to make this um, be very small so that we can discard all the terms of, uh, of order deltas square. OK, very good. So then let's continue. Uh, now, 
we have these two things where on the left we have rho h and here is h rho okay and there's a minus sign in between so that's just the commutator of rho and h so then we have rho of t plus delta was rho of t and then let's sort of write here plus i over h bar delta and now the commutator let me just see which one comes first so we have rho of t h so now let's move some terms to the other side and we have rho of t plus delta minus rho of t and now we divide everything by delta this is i over h bar rho of t h yeah. but now in the limit where delta goes to zero which is the limit that we're considering then this is just the derivative of rho with respect to time h that's kind of the definition of it so this is d dt of rho of t and now I'll, I'll just change the sign here so that we get a similar factor to the other to the other uh, Schrodinger equation so if I change a factor here what I need to do is to change uh, the order of the commutator right so I put a minus sign here and this is minus that okay so that's what we got and let's just compare it to pure states so for pure states what we had was this one here okay where one over i is the same as minus i so we can do the same here just to make them even more comparable one i okay and then we get rid of the minus sign okay so this is the Schrodinger equation for pure states and that's the general Schrodinger equation for mixed states where again the beginning was just the same we saw that the we just assumed that the evolution was given by the exponential of the Hamiltonian we expanded it and we obtained this so this is a time in the pen then sorry equation for mixed it and what's nice is that it's given in terms of uh, of a commutator very good. And then you can see that in the case where rho is just um, a pure state, you can see that this reduces to that. Okay, very good. So this is one of the generalizations, okay? This was this generalization, and now we want to do the second one. So first of all, so now open systems. And what I mean by open systems is the following. So we have HS, this is our system of interest, and this is an environment. And the assumption is that the dimension of the environment, so the dimension of this Hilbert space, is much, much larger than the dimension of the system. And then we say that overall, you have some kind of Hamiltonian of system and environment, and you have the, like a pure uh, a normal Schrodinger equation over, um, over the whole thing. So here we have e to minus i t over h bar and h of s e. However, this is a very large system and we cannot keep track 
of this. We may, maybe we don't even know all the details of this Hamiltonian, and uh, this is definitely like too large a matrix to compute. Okay. So what we want to know, maybe we start with some, um, even a, a pure state or a mixed state. Okay, but we don't know many details about what's going on in the environment side. So the only thing we care about is this row S of time equals zero is known. And we want to know how this evolves to some row S of time T, okay. which we know this is given by trace over the environment of US E of T, Rho S E of zero, U S E of T dagger, right? And another way to solve this, like this equation here, is by taking this Hamiltonian and just applying the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so this is what we want, but we don't want to go this long way around. So we don't know. Uh, maybe we don't know the full Hamiltonian of the whole system. Maybe. We don't know the full initial state of S and E. Hey, or maybe we even, we even know the Hamiltonian and the initial state, but it's just computationally too heavy to, uh, to do this big matrix multiplication and exponentiation. Okay. So we want to approximate rho S of T as a function just of rho S. So we want to know goal is to have rho s of t just expressed as some map that depends on t of rho s of zero. Okay. And we just want to know how this map acts here. Now, in general, this is not possible um, without putting here all the details of the bath, of the, of the environment. And one simple way to, to see this is to see that, well, as the system evolves, then it gets entangled with the environment. So obviously the next state in the system depends on previous interactions with the environment, which means you need to keep track of everything. Okay, so for example, suppose that um, we have a few qubits, so here's qubit S, starts in some state, maybe zero, and the environment corresponds of a bunch of other qubits, and you can, so this is the environment, uh, maybe in some phi zero of the environment. And the evolution is something like, well, I don't know, maybe there's a, a C naught, a Hadamard, okay, and then, I don't know, maybe there's some other gates going on between these two systems, maybe not a C not here, maybe now a C not there. You know, it could be whatever dynamics, okay? And if you have something complicated like this, then if you want to compute the state here at the end, you need to, you need to keep track of the global unitary and you need to keep track of the initial state of the environment, right? Um, and this is true in general. However, there are many cases in many physical systems where we can approximate what's going on here um, by a map that doesn't consider all the, all the richness, all the wealth of, what, of the global dynamics. And so what are the conditions for this? So I'll just write here assumptions. And the conditions are essentially that any correlations formed uh, with, the, with the environment of my system will get spread out to, this, to the environment very quickly. So it's almost like the environment is uh, interacting with a fresh uh, subsystem of, sorry, my system is interacting with a fresh subsystem uh, every time, instead of interacting with something that keeps a history. So for example, uh, so let me write it down and then I'll give an example. So the assumption is, um, previous 
correlations. Um, between system and environment. Can be ignored. So here's an example. And it's a nice example because we keep coming back to it. And that's my cup of coffee. And what's happening to the coffee here? Well, it interacts with the particles of air right? that are there touching the, the liquid. So the air is the environment and the coffee is the system. And when they interact, this interaction can be very rich, in particular can have a bunch of what turned out to be C0. So there is some entanglement caused between the liquid particles in the coffee and the air particles in the environment. However, the environment uh, moves very fast. So these particles of gas that interacted with my coffee will be out of my uh, coffee cup very quickly. So it's almost like my, my system is interacting with a new piece of air every time. Okay. So it, you don't need to keep track of the correlations that uh, were made between the, my system of interest and the environment before. Another example is say, I don't know, a, a little atom that can go from the excited state to the ground state, for example. This is something that loses energy, so this energy needs to go somewhere. And one of, way, one of the ways this does is to go away in the form of a photon. Okay, and of course that this photon is now, you know, the overall uh, interaction is like the interactions we saw before when we had a system of interest in the battery. Okay, and our photon is more or less like the battery. So it's like, this goes down, and this photon exists, or this stays here and the photon does not exist. And it's an entangled state between the two. And if this photon came back to interact with the system, then we need to keep track of what the initial joint state was. However, this photon, most of the time, unless I have like, I don't know, a mirror here or something, then this photon will go away. And even if I shoot some light at my system again, like to uh, excite it back up, then this will be a new photon that's not entangled uh, with my system of interest. Okay. So whenever you have a very large bath where the dynamics of this bath, of this environment, are somehow much, much faster than the dynamics of the interaction, so in this case, this photon dissipates, or here, like the air dissipates out too far away, and you have a, a fresh subsystem interacting with my system of interest. Whenever you have this kind of um, dynamics, you can do this. Um, we can do this thing that we'll do now. Okay? How do you know if this is the right dynamics? Well, you try. So you take a system and an environment in the sea. Well, what would happen if you assume that this was true? Then we'll get some equations that we'll see in a moment what they are. And you know, you simulate this, you compare to reality, you make measurements, you make experiments, and if they match, uh, then you know that your approximation is valid. Essentially, that's it. If, if for some reason the results then don't match what you're expecting, then you know, well, maybe this is very likely the problem that these correlations are not, um, are not going away. OK. Uh, and I've said, so then let's now uh, derive what happens under these circumstances. OK. So. And this is something, so in general, I avoid names, but this is a very common name, so we'll keep it here. So this is kind of the generalization of the Schrodinger equation to, the, to this particular type of open systems. Yep. And 
So the idea is to think again that we have some rho of t plus delta t, which is some epsilon that depends on this delta of the row. And th okay, and this is the row of the system always, the time t. Okay, so we're only talking about row of the system, so I'll omit the subscript system. And let's say that this is kind of um, rho plus delta rho. Okay, this is a, not not the same delta, but like uh, a little a little matrix where delta rho is very small compared to rho. Okay. okay. Now we just want to write now uh, this operator. The, so this this map is a completely positive trace preserving map. So we can write it in the cross operator representation, right? So we have epsilon of rho, which is rho plus delta rho. So and this is rho of t. And you write it as a k rho a k tag, right? Where these are just the cross operators. That we saw before. And here the assumption is well, because this is going to be um, very close to rho, then at least one of these cross operators needs to be very close to the identity, and the other ones will be kind of order of delta. So then we say, well, let's suppose that. let's say for k equals zero, we have that this a zero is kind of the identity plus a term that depends on delta. And now this could be here any um, operator and let's split it into the Hermitian and anti-Hermitian part. So we'll just call it L zero. We'll see why L later, minus i. And here let's write an operator called, uh, they call it small h, but I don't have the right calligraphy for this. Let's call it k, okay, for now. Times this delta, which is, uh, which is the same as this delta here. Okay? So that's the time, little time step. And all of the others we say, well, we want this to be kind of order of delta, so we want all of the others to be a k for k larger than zero. These are all going to be some operator l k, and then square root of delta. Because if we have something like this, then when we put everything together in this equation, then we get something that is just kind of um, size of rho and then delta. So in fact, let's do all these terms now. So the first term is going to be this a0 rho a0 dagger. And this is going to be, well, let's get it, so identity plus delta, and here this L0 plus uh, minus, could put place or minus. Okay. K is a big operator. Rho, identity plus dark, L0 plus IK. Because the idea is that now K is an Hermitian operator, L0 is also a Hermitian. Okay, so then this is what? It's just like we did before. So first you have the term with the two identities, that's just rho. Then we have this term with the identity on the other side, so that's rho 
L0, uh, so delta L0 rho, then you have minus delta I K rho. Then we have the terms of identity rho and this. So that's going to be rho L0 delta plus um, two, 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 rho I K delta plus now the terms that have this and this on both sides are going to be order of delta square so we're not going to care about that plus order of delta square so that's one part but in order to have all of this we also need to care about uh, these guys so we do the same and that's a bit simpler So a k rho a k for k larger than zero dagger. That's just going to be well. The delta comes from both sides, so it's going to become uh, not square root of delta, but just delta. And then we have delta. Uh, sorry, l k l k dagger times delta. Okay. Good. So these are the two terms, and now we need to put them all together to get um, to get this. But first, let's try to simplify the first term. Okay. So this first term here, what we have, so we have rho, and then we have this term plus this term. So that's delta. And then what we have here is the anti-commutator of L0 and rho. So the anti-commutator of two matrices, uh, A and B, just as a reminder, this is AB plus BA. So I didn't do anything, I just really replaced this in there. And then what else do we have? Well, we have this term where we have minus sign in one hand and plus sign on the other hand. Okay, so that's the that's gonna be the commutator. So let's write plus I delta and now here we have the commutator so plus comes first of rho and k okay. good so now we can write everything together so let me go and copy it copy there we go So now, how much is this? It's the first term and then the other term. So from this term, well, we can just copy it directly. Okay. Chuk. And now I'm missing just this thing down here. So let's write it plus delta. Um, sorry, what was it? Well, we have the sum over k larger than zero. And here we have lk rho lk dagger. Okay. All right. So from this equation, what can we do? Well, we have rho on one side, rho on the other. And of course, plus order of delta square. 
Okay, so then we have that this variation on rho. Please remember that this delta is not the same delta as on the right. This is delta. In fact, let's. We can leave it like this. And now what we have here is the sum of L0 rho plus I rho k plus sum over all the other case, 0 LK rho LK dagger. Yep. Good. So, um, now if we want to take this delta to the other side, we'll end up with a kind of similar situation as, um, as what we had for the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so we're going to send this to the other side. Uh, maybe it would be better to have written, yeah. In fact, sorry, let me let me do this a bit different from the from the book. Uh, so this is kind of the rho of time plus delta, and this is my rho of time. Okay, so let's not cut them. Instead, that's much better. Okay, so I have rho. So what we have here is now rho of time plus delta minus rho of time is equal to this. And now if we put the delta on this side, we get that a little differential equation. And now let's look at it a bit. So there's some terms here that are uh, new compared to the, to the Schrodinger equation. So let's bring back the Schrodinger equation. Where are you? There you are. And now let's compare the two. So this thing on the left here, well, this thing on the left here, this is the rho of t dt, right? And the thing on the right, well, this is new. It's nothing to do with that. This is new. But this term is kind of similar to this term here. Yeah. So we're just going to take this operator k, which all we know is that it's emission. And we're just going to say, well, we'll call k to be age of my system s over h bar. Because then I can rewrite the whole thing as d d t of rho of t is, well, 1 over i h bar h of s rho of t plus the new terms. So this L0 rho plus sum over k larger than 0 of L k rho L k tanker. Which tells me what? Tells me, well, if I have unitary evolution, let me. Um, I'll just copy this to a new page before we continue to analyze that. <laughs> if, for example, 
the age of system e is age of s times identity on e plus um, identity on the system times some h of e okay then if we have this kind of uh, non-interacting systems then you have that us e of t is equal to us of t ue of t okay where each of these is the exponential of the other one and each of this um, in fact acts like the identity in the other system times up identity on e okay so in this case if we have this kind of dynamics like we saw before uh, when we first talk about density operators if we have this kind of dynamics then we know that rho s of t is just going to be um, given by this right it's just going to be given by the evolution on s because it's really not interacting with ue which means that in this case this will be the kind of case where ddt of rho of t is just one over i h it's just the usual Schrodinger equation which is rho of t okay which means that here all the ak lks are zero yep. so this is uh, how we can relate this new equation that we found to the usual Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation is a special case where all these operators L are zero, which correspond to isolated dynamics. If there's some kind of interaction with the environment, then these things will not be zero. And um, yeah, and in the case where these dynamics uh, in, in the environment are much, much faster than the ones in the system, and you have this kind of every time you interact with a new part of the environment then these l's will not even depend on time they'll be fixed operators so after the break we'll look into more properties of this l system this l operators so see you again at quarter to 11. so where were we we said that if we have this form so remember we had some freedom in what this operator was like and we just said well this operator is the hamiltonian of the system s and the reason for choosing this is that in the special case where S is not interacting with the environment, uh, then we can just take this term to be the usual Schrodinger equation and say that all the other operators are zero, right? So that's what we have here. We recovered the usual Schrodinger equation. Now let's continue. So there's actually a bit more that we can say about these operators here. So we'll do that first. And this comes from this very simple normalization condition. of the density matrix and that's that trace of rho of t must be one for all time right okay so this means that in particular ddt of trace of rho of t must be zero but because the trace is linear and so on this is just trace of ddt of rho of t. This must be zero. Okay, so now we can plug this in in what we had before. So we have zero equals trace of, let's just write it again, ddt rho of t. It's a bit of a cheat here, but forgive me. And that's trace of all of this. Okay, it's, it's not a cheat because again, we consider a uh, very small time. So we know that this is kind of linear on, on row. So we, we are allowed to do uh, this trick. 
Okay. So we have trace of all of this. And now we use all the beautiful properties of this trace. So remember that the trace is linear and it's cyclic, which means that we can move operators uh, within. Okay, so then let's write all of these terms. So first we have trace of uh, one over h bar, and here we have h s rho of t minus rho of t h s. So that's this first term here. Plus, this is a plus over here, it's a plus, yes. Plus trace of the second term. And that's what? Well, that's L0. Rho of t. Let me just write rho instead of rho of t everywhere. Just to make it simpler, to make the notation a bit uh, more compact. plus rho L0. And then we have the last term here. So it's just sum over k larger than zero of trace of of. Mm, how do I do this? Let's make this one a bit smaller. Okay, so that. Chook, uh, chook. This is a trace of LK rho LK dot. Yeah. So this whole thing needs to be zero. And now we use the properties of this of the trace. So in particular, let's use linearity once more. So first we take the first term here. So it's one over i h bar, and now we have what? Trace of h rho minus trace of rho h. But because the trace is cyclic, and this means what? It means that trace of a, B, C is the same as the trace of um, sending one of them to the other side. So sending, for example, B, A to the other side of B, C, A. This means that the trace of this is the same as if we had the A on the other side. So this is the same as that. So that gives us zero, right? They cancel each other. Whoop. For the second term, we can do exactly the same. So we can have trace of L0 rho plus trace of rho L0. And this is just two trace of L0 rho. And then here, in the last term, what we can do is, again, very similar. Let me just make everything a bit small here. Chook. Chook. In the last term, it's kind of the same. So for each of these terms, I'm just going to send uh, uh, one of these LKs to the other side. Let me see. Sorry, just to see which one is more convenient to do. Yeah, let's send it to the other side here, to the back. So we send sum over k larger than zero of up, trace of lk dagger lk where all we did was to send this one to the other side. Okay, good. 
So let's uh, rewrite what we have in a new page. So we have that zero equals, well, this first term was zero anyway, the second term is two times trace of L zero rho, and the third term was plus sum over all the k's that are not zero, trace of LK dagger, LK rho. Okay, now let's bring them together again. We use linearity of the trace again. And you bring them together. So we have trace of, and let's divide everything by two because we can, right? So we can divide, divide by two, divide by two. Yep. And so we have trace of L zero rho, plus sum over k larger than rho, lk dagger, lk rho. And now we just isolate k on one side. So if l0 plus sum over k larger than zero. Different brackets. Lk, lk rho. Let's try, okay. Now, Needs, this thing needs to be zero, and it needs to be zero for all row, right? In particular, for any initial state row, uh, which has trace one. Which tells us what? Well, these operators for now, they can be anything that's um, just L zero had to be omission. Otherwise, it can be anything as long as they sum up to one in this way that we're used to. So what this, whole thing tells us is that if this is to be zero for all values of rho, in particular rho that can change this from the diagonal to off-diagonal terms, then this thing here needs to be zero. Yep. So the conclusion is that L zero plus K larger than zero, LK dagger LK must be zero, which means we go oh, over two, I forgot one over two, one over two. So if that L zero is minus one over two, LK, tiger LK, yep. So what we'll do for the, oh, sorry. Yeah, there was a half missing, yes. Uh, so, what we do now is that, okay, so, so then we can forget that we had a special operator called L0 and we'll just replace it in, the, in our uh, differential equation. So let's get the differential equation. Oh. So we have this thing here and now we just replace here the the L0. Okay, so then this is one over H bar, HS rho of T plus, and now this anti-commutator, well, with the factor of minus one half. So minus one half, and now the anti-commutator of what? Some of all the case, LK dagger LK. We can forget that there was ever a K equals zero, so we just replace it like this. Took plus some of all case, LK rho, LK. Okay. And this is uh, as much as we can simplify it for now. And this is what is called the Lindblad equation. Let me just copy it to the other side. And we will DDT of rho of t, and this is rho of t, and this is rho of t.
So this describes the dynamics of systems in contact with a large environment where um, correlations with this environment are very easily, are very quickly lost. And the set of operators LK, these are called the Lindblad equation uh, operators. So our goal is now to find for a specific physical system and physical situation, we want to find this L case so that we can decide on the on the evolution of the uh, of the system. And sometimes, you know, when we don't know the full Hamiltonian of if we knew the full Hamiltonian of system and environment, then this can be derived. But most of the time, we kind of just do this uh, sort of reverse engineering. So we, we have some idea, we measure the state of system S over time. We kind of map its evolution. And then from this evolution, so we have kind of this ingredient, we have this ingredient, and we try to find, we try to guess the values for these LKs that fit. Okay. And then we test this, um, this LKs. Okay, so it's kind of a pragmatic heuristic uh, way of deriving this Limbad operators. And for example, for thermalization, this is a thing that we're looking for and that we'll, we'll look into in the next course. The thermalization, so you, you want Rho of S for very large time to go approximately to this thermal state of a certain temperature, right? So E to minus um, this constant over temperature of HS divided by the partition function, right? So in this case, so for example, this is my, again, my, the state of my coffee in contact with a large environment. Okay. So we want to find if I can write, um, if I can write this density matrix as a form of time as a solution of this differential equation, and I know the Hamiltonian of the system, then what are the operators that I need to put here that give me, uh, that give me this, this time evolution that the system thermalizes? Okay. So that's uh, the question that we'll try to solve and that we'll see some examples. So either in, in the next lecture or in the tutorial next week. Okay, but before we get to this, we'll just look at one very simple example. Okay, so. Simplest example, and this is going to be, well, we take HS to be, so the Hilbert space to be just a qubit. And let's take the HS to be zero. So the Hamiltonian is the generate. Okay, so this is, for example, the case in, the, in this erasure that we were looking at. The other, the other day. And we start with any initial state. Rho S of zero could be anything. And so in particular, we can write it. It's just the density matrix of a qubit. So these are the coefficients. Okay. And let's think of the map induced, for example, by this erasure protocol that we saw. So remember the erasure protocol from the uh, from the previous lecture, what was it? it? Was something like this, where we started here with some initial state. In this case, it was a, a fully mixed state, but we wanted to end up in the ground state here. And we saw that we have a very large protocol that involves a bunch of qubits from the heat path and the battery and so on. But maybe there's a way to represent this map. Um, the, the effective map just on, on my system of interest. 
in this form that we just saw of the Limblad uh, equation. And one hint that this might be the case is the fact that we always took a new qubit from the, from the bus, so all correlations with the bus uh, were kind of lost for our, for our local evolution here. So we'll see an example of a map that in the long, long term acts like this. Of course, the, the short term dynamics will not be exactly the same because this depends on, on some coefficients. But we'll see if this works. Uh, okay. So we kind of want rho s of t going to infinity to be to be the ground state. It, uh, so, sorry, uh, to be state zero. From any initial state, we want to write this kind of erasure map in this Lindbladian form. And the nice thing is that we only need, uh, in this case, one Lindblad, um, one Lindblad operator from all of this. And this is going to be the Lindblad operator that takes state one to zero. So essentially we want the evolution to take state one to zero. And we'll see how this corresponds to the Lindblad operator. just L1 equals uh, so 0, 1. And times some value can be here, some constant. This constant will determine how fast this process is. Yeah. So if you wanted to model it in the, for our explicit erasure protocol, maybe this constant depends on the number of qubits from the path that we use. OK. Uh, good. So let's do it. Let's take the, the Lindblad, Lindblad equation. Okay. Now this is zero because we said here it's zero. And now in here we only have one operator, so let's write it. So this is minus one half. What is L1 dagger L1? So this is going to be one zero zero one, and that's one one, right? Okay. So then we have that here it's the anti-commutator between one, one times, uh, sorry, I forgot here, times this delta square. So let's put, uh, sorry, this lambda square, lambda square, there you go. And rho of t plus uh, the sum over k is only one. So we'll just write here, LK is zero, one, rho of t, one, zero. Okay. So that's the equation we need to worry about. Let's take it the other side. Uh, and I forgot here again the other square. Lambda square, right? Because it comes one from here and one from there. Assuming that this is, let's just assume for now that this is a real number. Okay. All right. So then what do I have here? So I have lambda square, and now I have 
one half of one one rho of t plus one half of rho of t one one up, plus this thing zero one rho of t one zero right which I can rewrite uh, this final term as if I look here, look, this is just one number. This is just, a, this is a number. And then we have here a cat and then a bra. So let's just write it like one, of t, one, and here's yours. Did I forget something? I forgot a minus sign there and a minus sign here. Okay, so that's what we have. Uh, and now, because this is a qubit, we can we can maybe uh, represent everything here as a matrix. Okay, so let's just put here that d d t over of t times one over this lambda square equals what? So what is this matrix? This matrix one one set matrix here minus one over half, and now I have my row of t. So row zero zero row zero one row one zero row one one minus one over half. Ah, let's just copy it again. Took times the other one, zero, 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 one. And now this, again, we can write this as the vector times the matrix times the vector, but it's very easy to compute what, what this thing is because it's just this value there. It's just this coefficient. So that's plus row one, one times this matrix zero, zero, which is just this matrix there. Okay, so now we just need to multiply these matrices and sum them. So let's see, we have minus so zero zero two 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 get zero zero on top, and here we get chook chook. So minus row one zero over two minus row one one over two. Okay, minus the other matrix. So we have chook, 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 chook. So this column is going to be zero. And here is going to be again minus row one, one over two. And there is going to be minus row zero, one over two. Okay. Plus last matrix was row one, one, zero, zero, zero. Yeah. Good. So let's just finish what we have here. So we have row one, one, minus row one, one, minus row zero, one over two, minus row one, zero over two, okay? And this whole thing is what? This is, so if I put here a, a square, this is d, dt of my original density matrix. So because all of these coefficients now depend on time, so I can put here the time explicitly. This is row zero, zero of t, row zero, one of t, row one zero of t, row one one of t, okay. Ah, we're done. So now all we have to do is to look here and instead of seeing uh, the derivative of, of a matrix, you can look at it as just seeing the derivatives of for all of this uh, matrix element. So it's like we have four different differential equations, okay. When the first one is what? 
Well, the derivative of uh, rho zero zero is just some other coefficient that has nothing to do with rho zero zero times um, this lambda square. And all the other derivatives, they depend on the original coefficient here. And then these two have a factor of one half and, and all of them have the factor of lambda and this doesn't have the factor of one half. So we just need to solve kind of each of these differential equations uh, individually and they're all the same. So I'll just call rho ij without a t, by this I mean rho ij of time equals zero. Okay. So if I solve all of this, what I get is that if I want to do rho, oh, if I want to do the evolution of the density matrix, copy, paste. What I'll get is that here, this is going to be my original row zero zero minus row one one with the original one. Uh, and now it's, it's always this thing like, what's the thing where the second derivative is that, is that times some constant, it's always going to be the, the exponential. Right? So it's always going to be this minus tuck. This constant second t, and you can do the math. Like you can actually check this derivative and see that that's the case. Here I just have rho zero one, the original one e two minus t over two, and this factor of two just comes from here. Here it's going to be the same. Rho one zero e minus one dot t square over two. And here we have rho one one e two minus oh, t square t. So you can check that, uh, you know, this is a solution of this differential equation, and this is a solution of this different equation, and so on. And so what does this tell us? First of all, if I want the t going to infinity, this means that this t is large. So all of these coefficients here, all of these terms are going to go to 0 in the limit of very large t. And this one is the one that's going to go to 0 the fastest. All the others have a factor of 1 half. And how fast they're going to go to zero depends on how strong this um, this lambda is. So how how high this lambda is. So at the end of the day, this is going to be this row zero zero. Okay. So at the end of the day, this is going to be uh, one. Oh, sorry. Th sorry. Uh, this should not have been row zero zero. This should have been one minus that. There you go. Okay. Okay. So, if we let it evolve for a very long time, we'll end up in the zero zero stage. Okay. So. Uh, what we'll do next time is then to kind of try to generalize this to the case where we want this not to be the zero zero state, but we want to have uh, want to have some coefficient here and some coefficient there, and we want this to be exactly the thermal state. You will do in the exercise next week also the case where you end up with the original row zero zero and the row one, one here, but these two go to zero. So uh, it will be like doing a measurement in this basis. So you get rid of the off diagonal terms, you get this pinching of the density matrix, but now instead of, of representing as some, as just a specific map or a specific unitary in a larger system, we'll just look at the Lindblad operators.
and we'll get uh, we'll just get this kind of form. So I will stop here. And now, so there's 10 minutes left from this lecture, which leads us to a total of, I think, 100 minutes. Or, sorry, 110 minutes that I owe you of lectures, which I'll try to uh, upload soon. But again, just to make a summary, what we saw today was, oh, was exactly to take whoop, to take the Schrodinger equation. We generalized first how the Schrodinger equation looks like for uh, mixed states. And then we looked at well, what happens if the system is not isolated. So it's not just dependent on some Hamiltonian, but it's dependent on um, more operators because it's in contact with some kind of open systems. Right? OK, so now that's kind of everything for now. We just need to see the example of this resulting in thermalization. And then we need to see the, this applied to the heat engines. And then that's it for thermodynamics. Very good. All right. So thanks for watching and see you uh, on Thursday.